<coughs> this is Fred Weller from How to RPG, and uh, we're doing Hero Quest. I am uh, going to explain more about why I would select Hero Quest on a channel that's supposed to be talking about role playing games, but um, I think that's probably something I'm going to save. Give me, give me a second, I'll, I'll get to that point. <coughs> Uh, so I'm going to put up a poll in a second, uh, which you feel free to take part in it. Uh, ask questions. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat the whole time. Uh, this is not going to be one of those times where I have a presentation and then I go to Q&A. Uh, the, the whole thing today is demonstration and explanation. Okay, so grab some foods and drink, make sure you're comfortable, and then we'll get started, shall we? <clears throat> Now I know there's a lot of videos out there that talk about HeroQuest, how to play the game. Uh, I guess for me, it's I guess just my perspective. How's it going Fred Hubba? How are you doing? Okay, let's get started, shall we? Hi, welcome to How to RPG. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about HeroQuest. HeroQuest is a board game and as you know, I cover role-playing games. So why am I talking about HeroQuest of all things? Well, the, the reason for it is because it's really kind of where everything started for me. And this, this board game, which I don't know that I can get it into the screen particularly well, but this board game made a big difference, uh, not just for me, but also my family. Like, um, this is where I play with my family all the time. Hero Quest, the board game. And uh, surprisingly, there's six of us in the family. So there are three girls and uh, three boys. And we all played together. And the age range was from about 15 or 16. I think I was either 15 or 16. Uh, right through to five. So, in fact, I think the youngest might have been younger than five, now that I think about it. So we, we, the age range was just very broad. Now I know the game says it's for ages 14 and above, but with a bit of guidance, a five-year-old can play this game, okay? That's what I've found. That's generally how I've seen things work out. So prepare, cook and survive. Hello, how are you? Spirit Wolf, hello, how are you? Okay, so given that, why would I cover Hero Quest on this channel? Well, one, because it was where I started. That's part of the reason. But it's a really good way of introducing... Uh, anybody, whether you're a, if you're a game master, or trying to be a game master, or trying to be a dungeon master, um, playing Zargon is a good training for becoming a dungeon master because it gives you all of the the basics. It's all codified. Uh, there's there's not a this huge broad canvas to deal with, so you just need to get familiar with the rules, and you can go for it. And it's it's all spelled out for you, so you don't have to worry about players doing something crazy and then trying to figure out how to resolve it. So there's a lot less uh, space required in your head to be able to do, deal with that. That's one of the reasons for doing it. The other reason is because my five-year-old five sister Rose could play this, and she might have even been four and a half, uh, with a bit of guidance, it means you can play with your kids. Now they might need a little bit of help around stuff, but they're going to pick it up really fast. As soon as you show them how it works and the dice and there's like almost no mathematics involved. There's very, very little inv involved. In fact, it's certainly not enough that a five-year-old couldn't deal with it. They were ready to go, okay? And the types of actions you can take, okay? So <clears throat> uh, Fred said his earlier versions had eight plus, I believe. New version has more fragile pieces. Yes, I believe you're right. Uh, there are some more fragile pieces. I don't think a lot of the pieces are necess necessarily made as well as they were. The furniture, of course, is extremely strong, but that's beside the point. But what I would say is a, a, a reasonably bright five-year-old can play this game. <clears throat> and, uh, and they'll have a good time. Okay, let's get on with the, the show, shall we? Because that's why you're here in the first place. So I'm going to go here. You won't be seeing my face, you'll be just seeing my voice for most of this. So the first thing I'm going to point out to you is you probably want to check all of your components um, before you start setting up and going through the next process. Um, I'm going to show you the process for setting up for Zargon. Um, so your game components is your, your, your actual board, your game board. 
There are 31 monster and miniatures, so make sure you have them all. There should be four hero miniatures, which is these things here. Okay, they'll be coloured red, unless of course you've painted them. The monster miniatures I've put into a container, and you might want to find a sort of a flat box to store them in your box, uh, the bigger box, just so that they're easy to um, access quickly. I, I would advise that. And maybe have another box available for all of your furniture. Um, and something that's sort of low lying, even an open top's fine, but just something you can sort of rummage through quickly. Okay. There are 10 skull pieces. <clears throat> I found the skull pieces were almost useless. I put them aside. I'm not even going to bother using them. There are four plastic um, rat pieces, or, um, and, and you could use them, I suppose. But fighting rats is um, it's a it's a joke. It's a joke in amongst uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and fantasy role-playing games that uh, to level up to do anything cool, you have to fight rats. So that I would, <laughs> I, would I would just ignore the rat pieces myself. Because they don't really fit onto anything, they're the free free roaming. You get dungeon doors, so you get a whole bunch of closed doors and open doors. You need to have them set aside and something you can access quickly as well. Um, and otherwise, it's going to be just too difficult to manage. I would just suggest again putting them into a box, maybe cut it down, uh, whatever will work for you. you. I'm sure you'll better figure that one out. Okay. Uh, you have your turn order cards. These you want to give to your players. The turn order cards, there's four of them, because you can have four players, uh, not counting um, Zargon. And then you've got your cardboard uh, tiles. So these are things like the, the staircase, which is very important. You'll need that a lot. That's the first piece you're going to be putting down. Uh, you've got uh, various things such as a pit trap. Uh, there's some icons here for special um, items and uh, blocked uh, passageway and then falling or um, uh, sort of the, the boulder trap, you know, the falling traps, <coughs> you've got those. And then you've got some double blocked walls and some, some grates that you can put in. So grab all your tiles, put them into something. I've put them into a little container like this. Uh, you want to make sure you have your character uh, cards. They aren't as big as they used to be. They're quite a lot smaller. So there's four of them. Hand them out to the players that are going to be playing those characters. This game is set up, all of the pre-made adventures are set up for four characters. So if you only have two players, get them to play two characters. Okay. If you've got one person playing, then you, they need to play all of the characters. Which might sound like a lot of work, but they'll have a good time and you'll be sitting back as you're playing Zargon. And they'll be, uh, they'll be doing most of the work, which is fine. Okay. You have your quest book which I'm not going to be going through. I'm not going to be spoiling it for you by going or duplicating any of the quests in here. I won't do that, okay? You have your Game Master screen. Your Game Master screen, its purpose is not, it's not so much about uh, not wanting the players to see stuff. Your Game Master screen gives you information about how the, the monster takes their, or the Zargon takes their turn, okay? How the players take their turn and a com combat summary which is very useful to have, but also all of the stats for the monsters. So you don't have to necessarily have the card in front of you, you can just look at your, your board. And it also, um, because the maps in Hero Quest for the pre-made adventures are so simple, it would only take a glance from a player to realize pretty much everything they need to know about the adventure. So uh, <clears throat> it's not so much about not trusting the people playing the game, it's more that just just by um, the process of osmosis, you might say, or the process of just seeing it, they would probably understand everything they need to know because they are so simple in terms of their layout. Now uh, you have a pad for your character, so make sure they get a, get one of these. If they use pencil, they can reuse them, so you don't wind up going through your pad too quickly. You might want to make sure you photocopy it when you start getting to near, near the end so you have replacements when you want to use it again. Um, you have your... Combat dice, there are <clears throat> six combat dice and then there's uh, six red dice for movement. You need a reasonable space to do this, people. If you don't have a reasonable space, it's going to be really, really difficult. My advice is either lay it out on a floor floor area or lay it out on a, a reasonably sized dining room table or a coffee table. You need to have enough space, not just for the board to be laid out, which takes up look, more than the, you can see my camera can't actually capture the entire um, game board. So you need enough space for that, plus space around it for everybody to put their stuff. Because if they're putting stuff on the game board, it's just gonna get in the way. So the table needs to be probably a table that would seat six people, if you know what I mean, okay? 
<clears throat> Who else have we got here? Um, Dungeons and Chronics, how are you? How are you doing? Uh, broadsword, I, I don't, I'm not sure what Broadsword is all about, but uh, anyway. It is a very pricey game, Nacho Nacho Man. Uh, Nacho Nacho Man is a patron and supports me on Patreon. Um, I'm probably going to explain to you the, how to build your own hero quest. Do you know what I mean? Uh, because the rules, I didn't put it down in the description, Nacho Nacho Man or anybody else, but the rules for hero quest are free. You can actually download from Hasbro the free instruction book. Now, I don't know about the quest books, but I know that the um, the rules themselves, this rule book here, everything in here is completely free as a PDF. You can you can just download it for free. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty expensive anywhere. I, I agree, Fred. <clears throat> uh, laminate use dry erase, uh, but not red or orange. Well, yes, that that's always helpful. Okay. Now that we've gone over some of that stuff and all the bits and pieces here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move everything out of the way and then I'm going to go through the setup process with you so that you know how to do that. And, and if it's, it's been 35 years since I played this game, people. So if you find that I make a mistake, there's probably because my brain is working off information that I had many, many, many years ago rather than uh, information that... Uh, <clears throat> As a, as a product of having played the game just recently, because <laughs> I haven't played it recently. All I've been doing is studying up as much as I can, so I remember how, how it works. Not to mention the game that I played is probably slightly different to the North American or this version. Um, the release, the new release is going to be slightly different, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So let me just move all of this out of the way, like so. And I think, <clears throat> all right, okay, so now we have a clear board. This is where you're going to be starting. This is what it, your board is probably going to start off as, okay? This is what you get when you've been again, beginning doing this. Uh, is Dungeons & Dragons adventure board game similar? No, it's not, it's not nearly as good. Um, I would say that HeroQuest is better. The Dungeons & Dragons... Um, Adventure Begins board game is a, a cheap, nasty knockoff of an attempt to do something like this. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately. What is it? Uh, Ye Old In the website has lots of free content and rules for HeroQuest. Okay, cool. What's this? Rush the Wash, your YouTube channel is, has uh, great painting um, tutorials, just in case this helps anybody uh, okay all right moving on <clears throat> so here is our board the first thing we need to do is we go through our step and set up for um, Zargon everybody picks the character they want to play somebody has to play Zargon which is basically um, the role of an evil sorcerer okay the important aspect of this is you need to make sure you are sitting behind the game master screen you control the quest Okay, and you, and you know what the where the monsters are, the secret doors, the treasure, the traps, in this labyrinth that you're going to be playing through. Okay, or this dungeon, and you are the one who has the quest book. So the first thing is, I would suggest reading the rules. So read the rule book, understand them as best you can, um, and if you don't, that doesn't work, go watch some videos. Okay, then go through and look at the quest book. The quest book can be studied and figured out in less than five minutes. You can be ready to go that quickly. It's not like playing Dungeons and Dragons or other fantasy role-playing games. You're going to open your quest book and you read out the first quest. Or whichever quest you're playing. The first quest is um, the trial and you, you give that a go. You know, you read that out, they have a, a, a good idea of what it's like. Um, it's the parchment text that you're going to read out to the players, not everything else. So yeah, look at the parchment section. Uh, then you're going to look at your quest map so you have a good idea of where everything is laid out. Um, you don't put anything out on the board until you're ready to play. Okay. My suggestion to you is the first thing you want to do is you want to um, ensure that everybody has the dice they need. You probably want to give the players three of the attack dice so that they've got them. Only the players will need the six-sided dice, so give them those as well, right? Make sure they have their, their characters set up and ready to go, whichever ones they have taken. 
And the first thing you want to do once you've read it out is you're going to look through there and you're going to place out your your first square, your first marker. This is where the staircase is. This will be the room they're starting in. Now you might be starting in a small room or you might be starting in a large room. As a general rule, the only things you ever put out in a room, okay, when they are in a room, are the staircase. You can put out monsters. You can put out doors that aren't secret doors. But I wouldn't put out anything else. Those are the only things I would put out if I were you. Okay. Furniture, that's definitely fine. But things like treasure or treasure chests, things like um, traps, uh, secret doors, those are all things they have to find themselves. So we'll just place our token there. And you're going to put out, there needs to be a door. So make sure you put the closed door on, not an open door. So this is a closed door. And then all of their characters need to be placed onto the staircase. Uh, <clears throat> like so. And you probably want to put the uh, the ones who are going to be leading the group, you probably want to put them closest to the door so that they wind up being the first ones to, to start. Okay? However you might decide to do that. Maybe you decide to go this way. I mean, it's up to you. Okay, so we've got our four characters out. That's done. You've read out your description. You're ready to move on. Okay? <clears throat> uh I guess the, the easiest things to, to remember is um, your sorcerer, or should I say your wizard, and your elf are going to have to select uh, magic cards. Okay, there are some magic cards here. I didn't mention that before. Um, I was kind of jumping that. And I, 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 what I thought I would do is rather than explaining uh, the, the wizard and the elf's magic cards right now, I would leave that to later on. If you want me to explain it today, I will. Okay? Otherwise, no. Uh, house, wheeler, home rules. Look, we'll talk about how, um, house rules some other day. Um, I, I think that will be in about three weeks. We'll talk about that sort of thing. But probably not today. Just the basics for now. If you have questions, I'll certainly answer them. <clears throat> okay, so your first, first point of call is usually what you do is the person to the left of Zargon is going to start their turn. Okay, this is your setup. You've laid it all out. You've got what you need. You're ready to go. You've made a pile for each of your different cards, so you're ready to play. Um, when you're taking your turn, it looks like this. The order of play. It always begins with the hero seated to Zargon's left, and then you continue clockwise, and Zargon, the person playing Zargon, will go last. So you probably, if you can help it, you probably want the Barbarian going first or the Dwarf or the Elf and the Wizard going last. Just because you don't want the Wizard leading the group and you don't want anybody who's um, vulnerable to being uh, taken out too quickly, um, being taken out too quickly. So putting the, the stronger, tougher individuals in the front is probably a better idea. And I would say Barbarian, Dwarf, Elf, Wizard, something like that, or that some sort of combination. You can swip the, switch the Dwarf or the Elf if you like. But it's really, it's up to them, ultimately. They'll figure out um, better strategies as they go, okay? So each person takes their turn. So when you're taking your turn, you decide what you're going to do. You have a choice when you're taking your turn. You either move, which means you're going to roll your six-sided dice first, or you perform an action. And I'll explain what the different actions are in a second. Now, unfortunately, Hero Quest consists of uh, six-sided dice for movement. So there's no fixed movement, which is a bit of a pain. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a great situation when you play a game and uh, everything is dependent on how well you roll. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> in terms of movement. But this is how this, the system hasn't been changed. They haven't really changed very much about it. And as a result of that, you, you kind of, you're kind of stuck with moving uh, by rolling the dice. Which means your movement is going to be anywhere from a 2 to a 12. Yeah? Which I, I, I frankly find very frustrating. Um, and I will talk a little bit about other ways of doing that rather than working that way. So Hero's Movement. Uh, oh, by the way, the different actions you can take 
are the following. You can attack, you can cast a spell, you can search for treasure, which is the treasure chests, which I'll show you shortly. You can search for a secret door, you can search for traps, and you can disarm traps. Now, disarming traps can only be done by certain characters. Um, and the only ones who can really um, disarm traps are usually the elf and the dwarf. Anybody else is not really um, capable of doing that efficiently. Um, you'd have to do some sort of house rule, as far as I remember. Okay, so, hero movement. As a hero, you normally begin and end um, a quest in the room marked with the staircase. So, one of the first things I'm going to say is if you find your players are getting absolutely smashed about, they can leave the adventure early. It's something that a lot of us didn't actually, uh, it didn't occur to us, where we get mashed up really quickly in the first part of the adventure. We knew we couldn't finish it, and so we had to make a choice. Do we do we press on and probably wind up dying, or do we just return to the staircase and consolidate what we had done before? That means we might still have to return to the same dungeon adventure later, but at least if we had picked something up uh, that we could use, then there was a benefit, and also too, it meant our characters didn't die, and we didn't wind up having to bring in a new character later after somebody else picked up whatever gear we had. So you can actually leave before completing the quest. You don't have to just keep bundling on. Uh, I know that's one. Of, I think that's one of the things that <laughs> me and my younger sister and my group um, looked at, and we we're like, "Hang on, we can actually leave early." It doesn't say anything about not being able to do that. And even if it does, um, does we probably just ignore that anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let's go back to where was I? Sorry, I'm looking at um, a whole lot of stuff at the same time. So the staircase is supposed to lead downward, deeper into the stronghold. Okay, of your, your evil um, dread sorcerer or whatever. Uh, so you complete your quest, and when you complete your quest, you head back to your staircase. Um, I always found that if we manage to clear out the entire place, it is almost completely pointless to, if there's no more monsters on the um, board and there's nothing else left to explore, there's no point rolling six-sided dice till everybody gets back to the staircase. It's a giant pain in the, don't even bother with that. Okay. So, we roll our dice first. And I'm going to have the Barbarian go first. And he gets... A six and a five. You can use all of your movement or you can just use part of your movement. You don't have to use absolutely every aspect of it. So you move up. I can move one square and then I can perform an action. One of the things I always found really odd about this game is we used to have arguments about, so what's the deal with opening a door? Like if we want to open a door, yeah, what, is that, what does that actually count as? Um, well, it's part of your movement as far as I remember. And as far as I can tell, it hasn't changed in the, the new upgraded version. So, uh, yeah, part of your movement, you can just open a door. It's not counted as an action as such. So you open the door, take away the closed door, put in an open door, and then you can move out. Now, as soon as they move out into the space, okay, um, it's probably really horrible to put traps and various things into the staircase room. Usually the staircase room is empty. So now you can see down here. You can also see partly down this way and over to here to the square. Um, so this is where you lay out. If they can see anything down here, this is where you put it. If there's monsters to be laid out or there's blocked passageways, put them out now um, so that they know where they are and then they can move. They can decide to go this way or this way. We'll go this way and now we can look down this way and this way. Okay, there's no facing rules with the miniature. You, you just look down both ways. Okay, whichever space you're in, you can see everything down that corridor, unless it's blocked off. <clears throat> Sorry about that, I'm losing my voice. You need to use line of sight. So line of sight is pretty basic with this. Anything that's in the way blocks your line of sight, pretty much. So a closed door um, would block line of sight. Um, uh, something like a a block square. So this this thing here, this is a block square. That would block line of sight. You can't see past there. But then, of course, you probably wouldn't be able to get past it either. That one also, too, would do the, pretty much the same thing. <coughs> and um, and then we move on to what do you want to do next? Well, you can, can continue to move. You've moved um, uh, three squares, 
and we've got 11 to move. You can't move diagonally, you have to move horizontally or vertically. That's the, the only thing I would say to you. Uh, once you open a door, it cannot be closed. This is something that um, my group eventually wound up house ruling and we changed, but yeah. So you can then walk down here and you're looking obviously for more doors. You're looking for the next closed door, okay, that allows you to move into another room. So uh, say for example, we see a door here. So we've moved four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Can't see anything else. Nine, ten, and we can finish there. But we don't need to open the door if we don't want to. And we've already had our turn. We've already opened the door. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's your turn done with your barbarian. And then you would move on to the next person. Uh, what's this here? Hello, buried axe blade two. How are you doing? Perhaps opening the door carefully takes an action, just um, going through it, uh, movement. Um, well, there is a section on movement. And so, so and it but does state looking, so looking and opening doors are simply considered to be additional things you may do on your turn. So it's like a free action, okay? So it's probably not wise at the end of your turn to open a door unless you have backup. You could, I suppose, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it if I was you. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> All right, so that's your process for moving and taking actions. We're gonna move on to doing some attacks. So at some point, we're gonna move everybody else into sort of a, a decent position. I'm gonna just push us forward a little bit rather than have everybody um, move so they're all over by this door and we'll position something like that you can spread it out however you like you might want to move around people um, you can move through your allies squares so you can't move through a monster square okay and uh you this is that's that's the the, the general rule so we're going to just say they will move through all here this is one of the problems though when you're all trying to line up on a door is the the idea is you're waiting for everybody to be in position and so somebody might wind up just sitting there doing nothing. This is one of the more annoying annoying aspects of HeroQuest. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it now. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, it rolls around. Zargon, if there's nothing active on the board, Zargon doesn't get to do anything. Okay? The players you wind up doing everything. So now that they've taken all of their turn, we can now start looking at how to make an attack. Um, and what happens when we open a door and there's something in it? So um, let's say the Barbarian, we're, wait, we're back at the Barbarian, they roll their dice. Now you need to decide whether you're going to move first or not. But we roll our dice. You can't split your movement, so you either have to move first and take your action, or take your action and then move. And it's a, it's a very simple, clean process. Uh, let me just grab another door, an open door, if I can find an open door. Where are the open doors? Ah, oh, there we go. That's what I wanted. Open door. So the barbarian decides they're not going to. They've rolled their dice. They're not going to move just yet. They're going to open the door. It's like a free action, like I said before. And then what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to look in the room to see what's there before they decide what to do with the rest of their action. Okay, their, the rest of their turn, should I say? So this is where you put out your um, terrain. Um, you can't interact with terrain, unfortunately, in a hero quest adventure. It's not built into the game. It's kind of one of those weird things. Um, I'm not really a fan of that. So maybe you see a table and there is a, oh, let's stick a, is it a bookcase? No, a fireplace. We'll put a fireplace in here as well. There's a fireplace. Okay. And there's no other doors in this, in this location. That's it. So you put out your furniture. And then if there's any monsters in the room, you would also put those out as well, if they are visible, okay? So our first thing is we'll grab a monster that is suitable, say a couple of goblins. Oh, that's me losing things. So we've got a couple of goblins and they're around a table, say. Something like that. Ugh. Okay. So at this point, the barbarian can make their choice about how they um, 
do things they can see this now they can stand there now that they've opened the door and choose to do one of the actions that was stated before which is if you want to you can cast a spell which they don't cast spells you can search for now searching is difficult if you've got monsters around you probably don't want to be doing searching so moving in to wherever you want to be and you need to get you're either going to have to be standing here or standing here and move two squares to be able to attack the goblin okay you can't really be anywhere else so you've got to decide where you want to position yourself um, I would suggest probably as close to the door as possible but still allowing people to move through easily and so I can't do anything else with my movement but I can now make an attack your attack dice are listed on your character sheet so it's actually stated here so the barbarian has three for the attack and two for the defense uh, they have body which is eight uh, body points and their mind points are two and when you wind up with your character down to zero body points your character is dead dead as door not okay so what we'll do is we'll we'll roll if I can get this to come off there we go for roll three dice we're going to take our action and attack the goblin now you'll notice that there are different things on here I've rolled two skulls that means that there are two strikes on the on the goblin right now there are other symbols on here there are shields that shield there is for a hero blocking a skull that there is the monster skull uh, a monster shield and that monster shield blocks a hero's attack so they're different shields for different uh, different characters characters shield is this the monster shield is this okay but I got two skulls and one monster shield, so we ignore the monster shield, we just take those two. So there's two strikes. The goblin gets to actually respond to that attack and try to counter it. So what you do is you grab uh, two attack dice because your goblin has two attack dice and you try to defend to see if you can actually stop the hit coming through. I'm going to move this over here. Okay, so one monster shield and one skull I ne ignore the skull and just take the one monster shield <clears throat> so the goblin has just taken one uh, one blow now the problem with a goblin it's only got one uh, body point and unless the monster has more than one body point usually the the best way to deal with this is just remove the monster from the table okay if they have more than one body point then there are little tokens that you put underneath them these things, the little skull here on a, on a black background, you put them underneath to represent how many blows they've taken. But with monsters that only have one body point, they are dead, okay, once you hit them and they and you and you do one point of damage. And that's exactly what the um, barbarian did. So the barbarian can't do anything more at this point. Yep. <clears throat> so we'll put them back over here. And we go through the same sort of process. Zargon may never get to do anything if everybody's taking their turn in the right order. This is this is why turn order is really important. Um, and you might think that this game winds up being extremely uh, boring because there's a lot of luck luck involved. And, and I absolutely agree. Yep, absolutely. There's an enormous amount of luck involved. Uh, but you also remember you're you're teaching a process rather than you're you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, what do we got here? I'm going to do the dwarf in a second. So I want to do the dwarf next, but I see that there's somebody in the in the chat here that I recognize. Um, Ruxa Zero, hello, how are you? Um, hello, Michael. Michael is a patron and supports me on Patreon. I have actually never heard of the, the game until this channel, uh, until you mentioned it, Fred. Well, I'm glad that you now know about it, uh, Michael. And I'm going to, over time, show you that you can probably build your own Hero Quest game if you really wanted to. It wouldn't be too difficult. Uh, this game started my Warhammer D&D journey. It was uh, very popular in the UK. Uh, so I also played a lot of Space Crusade. And if anybody remembers Space Crusade, it was kind of like the science fiction version of Hero Quest. What do you got here, Buried X? You painted a replica map of the HeroQuest map on the on a table. Oh, cool. Um, is it Derry with the Inception? I don't know what you mean. Uh, so what is this? Because this is where I discovered D&D. 
in the UK, in England, okay. All right, so let me move on and let's do the, the dwarf. Because I'm hoping that the the uh, the goblins won't all get um, destroyed, but that might happen. <laughs> so then the dwarf can roll, remember, you can roll your dice first and then decide to move um, after if you want to. It makes more sense that your dwarf actually move first, yeah? So you can go here. As I said, you can you can take other actions, but it's, it, it doesn't make any sense to do so with monsters around. Um, and so that's one, two, three. Can't through move through the um, terrain of a uh, piece of furniture. So um, that's three. Now we're going to get there. Four, five, six, seven, eight. We're diagonal now, but we got nine, so we can get to there. So now the, the dwarf can actually make an attack. So same sort of process, have a look at how many attack dice they have. Their attack dice is two and their defense dice is two. So we're going to use just two in this case. And roll them. Okay, so we got a shield for a hero and a shield for a monster. So we, we completely missed our target. So we've moved, we've attacked, our dwarf is finished. Okay, so we'll get rid of our dwarf and we'll move over to the elf. The elf can do something similar, okay, probably a good idea to roll your dice first so you can decide what you're going to do. Okay, I rolled a 10, which is a good number. So the elf can go 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so we now surrounded our, uh, our goblin. Uh, You'll notice that when I'm moving, I'm never moving diagonally because you can't move diagonally. You're only allowed to move horizontally and vertically, right? So our elf is built very much like the dwarf. There's uh, two attack dice and two defense dice. So we need two of these dice to do our attacking. That's the white ones. So I've got two skulls, which is a good result. But the goblin, remember, has two defense dice, uh, one defense dice, one defense dice. Sorry, I rolled two dice. It's because I was looking at the attack dice, wasn't it? Sorry, it's one defense dice. So I only get one of these to, to roll as defense against that attack. I made a mistake there. So it's a skull. That's not a defense. I had to roll the monster shield. The monster shield's only on one side of the six-sided dice, so it doesn't come up very often. Okay, so, uh, so you wind up wounding the goblin twice, and a goblin has only got one hit point, uh, one body point, so you take that away. It's It's been dispatched. Okay, it's at this point that things change. Um, you can have, once the, the elf has moved, taken their turn, and we go to the wizard, the wizard can then choose to move by rolling their dice. I got five, not very much. One, two, three. And they might decide, <clears throat> now when you're searching for things, you need to be in the room you're searching. One of the worst things you can have is you find yourself in a situation where you're searching, but the trap is right on the inside of the door, like right where the, the, the wizard is right now. This is the wizard character. That's like the worst situation, because usually when you're searching, you do so when you're in that room, which is a bit of a drag. There's nothing to fight, so we don't want to do an attack. Instead, we look at something else as an option <clears throat> out of our actions that we had before. And that is searching. And as we said before, you can search for certain things. So now you have to decide what's the most important thing to search for first. Usually the best thing to search for first is traps. Um, if you've already engaged in um, battle and you've already walked just about everywhere in the room and you haven't found any traps, you may not need to worry about doing that. But you may still want to, because you can have a trap in the same space potentially as treasure. <laughs> so searching for treasure, searching for traps, searching for secret doors is probably one of the things you're going to do absolutely last out of everything. So searching for traps is probably the best thing to do now, even though there's still maybe a couple of squares that haven't been covered, right? So there are four types of traps. There is the pit trap, which is designated by this token here, okay? There is the uh, falling trap, which is the, the boulders that I'm just showing you now. There is a spear trap, which doesn't have a token, but is represented by a, a spear on the, on the map. And then there is a, a, 
um, chest furniture trap. And so uh, I guess the best way to describe that is you just put out the appropriate furniture piece. So... Um, so when you search for a trap, you do not place the trap out. You simply point to where the trap is when they do the search. Okay. Uh, the only traps you actually generally put out are the, um, the, the pit trap, the falling trap. You simply point to where the spear trap is because spear traps, once they're activated, they don't do anything else after that. Um, and they have to be in a room or corridor that you are currently in. If you move into those spaces with those traps, they activate and they do some pretty horrible things. Um, and in terms of the treasure chest, usually what I used to do is I just point at where the, the trap was, and um, we used to have the argument about, you know, if what, what if it's a, a chest furniture trap? Well... Furniture you're going to see, um, a treasure chest, you only put the treasure chest out once they start saying usually um, that they're looking for treasure. But you can point out where a trap might be. Um, I think that's one of the things that used to um, frustrate me was if you, if you find a trap in a particular space and you know there's a trap there, why would you not know that there's a treasure chest there as well? And I think the, the thing to remember about the treasure chest is um, is it's not actually a treasure chest necessarily. It might be that uh, it's something that you find underneath a flagstone or a compartment in a wall, but it's in that space. Um, or it's something that isn't uh, completely obvious that's in that space, but you, you need to look more carefully to find it. When you search, you do not need to walk around the room too. You can just look at everything uh, in the room by just being in that space or that corridor. <clears throat> and uh, yeah when you're searching for traps you do need to state that you are searching for traps uh, how is our chat going um, where are we scrolling down here have we got any questions you still have it hello Mike G how are you doing the original version had Way more cardstock and, and furniture. Yes, yeah, it was all cardstock furniture. This version, definitely, I think the upgrade was in the furniture. I don't know about any, for everything else, though. Um, some of the miniature sculpts are pretty good, though. Okay, so I don't see any questions. There's more than one floor. Uh, you, you can add additional floors, so that would be another adventure. Okay, <clears throat> cool. Let's uh, Let's move on. Uh, I guess the, the the first thing we need um, to sort of break down maybe is if we search for traps and there is a trap. So I say there's a trap here. Nobody stood on the trap. If you stand on a square that has a trap, it activates, by the way. Monsters can stand on a trap and they don't spring the trap because they know the trap's there, by the way, which is kind of a, <laughs> kind of a pest because you can often get the delusion that you're all safe and in fact, there is traps there. And then for some, whatever reason, the monster steps onto that square. It kind of, it's very gamey. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, it's just it's just basically how it works. So uh, the different types of traps and how they work. Uh, falling traps are activated and work a particular way, and so do spare traps. So this is what happens with a spare trap. You roll one of the uh, white dice for a spare trap if they wind up activating it. So if there's a trap here, I don't place it out until it's been dis um, disabled. But I'm, what I'm going to do is at least demonstrate what you do with the traps. Okay? I'll get rid of these dice here. That's going to confuse things a little bit otherwise. So you roll one of these white dice, and if you get a skull, that trap actually hurts the hero. Okay? So one spear, uh, one spear trap is designated as rolling one dice and you only suffer a, uh, a body point of uh, damage if if you roll a skull and I didn't roll a skull it was a shield yep um, if you roll either the the black or white shields uh, you've this is this this determines I've dodged it 
You dodged it. You know, that would be a dodge. That's what it represents. And then you can then continue with your movement. Um, the spear is always gone. Okay, so it's now a safe, um, safe square if you're using one of those. Now, the falling block trap is probably one of the worst ones. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've got a bit of gas here. Uh, because you roll three of these things. You roll three white dice. If you activate a falling block trap, it's three white um, dice. And every skull is a body point of damage. Um, and you can't roll to defend. There's no rolling to defend against it. Okay, this is the thing with traps is it's it's very much a luck factor. So if you were activating potentially the the falling trap, which is this token here, and somebody was in that space, say our, our wizard, you'd be rolling this, and I rolled two skulls, and one shield, that represents a dodge, but this doesn't, so you get hit twice, and so you deduct from your body points for your wizard, two. Okay. Um, now, what, once you've activated a falling block trap, um, you, you place it underneath the hero, okay? And um, you also got to make a decision about um, either moving ahead or moving backward to an empty space because you can't stay in the same square as the, uh, the block. So... And, and this, is, this is one of those times where it's about strategy, right? Because you, you can't stay in that same space. Um, so you have to decide to go to a square that's appropriate. Remember, vertically or horizontally, you've got to make a choice. So that is the falling block trap. Uh, the pitch trap, which for the life of me, here we go, pitch trap. <clears throat> so with a pit trap if you find one you're going to oh, oh sorry people I'm scratching myself a little bit <laughs> dear um, Let me just go over to chat again. Uh, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought there. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Uh, now, I think a falling pit, pit trap is, doesn't require dice. It's one of those things where um, you put the, the pit trap tile down under the um, hero and you tell them that they have suffered one body point of damage so pit traps always do one point of body damage and then and then your turn ends and you must actually record it down on your sheet of course but there's a process for getting out of a, um, a trap so even though it does automatically does one body point of damage uh, once you're in the trap you may search the trap for treasure because sometimes they can have treasure in a pit trap you can even find secret doors in a pit trap. So I'll get rid of this. So if they're in a pit trap instead of there's a block there. So all of those things can be found down there. It's it's a it's a really awkward um, situation, but I think it's trying to duplicate a lot of the old school original sort of dungeons that were played. Um, so when you're in a pit, um, a, a pit, you may also attack and defend. It's not a great idea to do so. But you, you're rolling uh, one fewer um, dice if you're doing so. So if you're making any kind of attack, if you have, say the wizard has one attack dice, um, you're rolling one less. Um, so as a hero, your minimum attack or defense strength is always one combat dice, even if the, the pit would give you down, take you down to zero. So if you have like a wizard and their attack dice, and you're trying to attack from there against a, another creature that is not in the pit, so they're here, he's got a goblin here. Um, instead of taking that that uh, that dice away to attack them, um, you still retain it. But if you were playing, say, the, the Barbarian, the Barbarian's different in that the Barbarian has three attack dice, but you would have to take one away. So you'd still be left with two. And with your Elf and Dwarf, they normally get two attack dice, but if they're in a pit, 
you have to take one of those away and you're left with one instead of two if you're dealing with a pit okay so that's how that works so you never wind up with zero attack dice if you're in a pit you can normally move out of a pit on your next turn, but you can't do so on uh, on your turn because your your turn essentially ends once you wind up in a pit. Uh, so once the the pit uh, pit trap is sprung, uh, you put down your your pit trap um, tile on the board, and the trap cannot be disarmed or removed. So if you activate it, it can't be dealt with after that. Um, and you might actually have to jump a trap. There is a section on jumping over traps. Would you believe it? <laughs> uh, so if you want to actually disarm it, you need to make sure you don't activate it first. That's just, I guess that makes sense to a large degree. Yes or no? Probably. Maybe. Okay, so the chest or furniture trap. We'll get rid of this. And uh, I'll only just use the chest as an example, but you can have a trap on the fireplace or the table if you really wanted to. Normally they don't put the traps on doors, although I suppose you I suppose you might be able to do that. It seems pretty ruthless, but you, you could, I guess. So a, um, a chest or furniture trap can be any variety of things. And they could be like uh, poison gas or needle uh, poison needles or uh, explosive latches or a shooting dart you can actually make all of that up how they work mechanically is almost identical but the way that you describe it is really up to you when you're making your own stuff so um, if the room or corridor that the the chest or the furniture is located in is being searched for traps then zargon player then says that the um, the chest furniture looks dangerous and points to it so you actually point to whatever it is okay in this case so once a um a, a chest or furniture trap is discovered you have an attempt you can you can attempt to actually disarm it but you can also this is i think the only time that you're probably going to wind up activating a um a furniture piece of furniture trap is if there's some stipulation that there's a space around it that allows allows it to be activated because you don't normally manipulate um, the tables or the fireplace, which is kind of like a, a bit of a, a bu um, bummer. But something like a, um, a treasure chest trap, it's a little bit different. Okay. So as your hero, if you're searching a room for treasures, um, such as, uh, you know, valuables like gold or magic items or pieces of equipment, um, you would, again, you, you roll your dice, you move okay and uh, if you activate it then it works a particular way and usually there's a lot of different ways it can work <laughs> um and i've i've tailor made these uh, a few times um so every almost every single piece of furniture or um chest trap uh, i think probably most people look at uh, modifying that the most out of everything else Uh, now, where am I? Pit traps. Yeah, we I did cover pit traps. Falling rock trap is horrible in a corridor. Yeah, you can get, get cut off from the party. Yes, Mike, that's true. I always found it to be um, really painful as a as a product of uh, the whole situation. It's like, what do you do at that point? <laughs> uh, dear. Now the rule book, by the way, is 32 pages, and you would think that, I mean, I've described a lot of stuff, and it sounds really, really complicated, does it not? Uh, I mean, if, if I were thinking about, and I and didn't Fred just say a five-year-old can play this? Trust me, with a lot of guidance from an adult or somebody who does understand the game, a five-year-old can play this. Um, they will, I, mean, I don't know what it is, but uh, they, 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 they pick it up. They pick it up pretty fast. Disarming a trap. Let's have a look at disarming a trap. Because that's probably your, your go-to at some point, is when you do find a trap and you need to deal with it. Um, I will get rid of this. And um, we'll just leave them there. I'm going to use the same room. Um, we'll use the elf. I think the elf is a good example of this. So 
When you want to actually disarm a trap as a hero, to disarm it, okay, it has to be unsprung. You can't have, you need to know where it is. So the, the game master points the square. I'm pointing out the square is here. Uh, and then they, they're going to dis disarm it, okay? Um, you must possess a toolkit. Um, so if you don't have a toolkit, then it doesn't work. If you don't have a toolkit, then you need to be a dwarf. And the toolkit must be purchased between quests. Okay, it's part of the equipment. Um, so in the equipment section, this is the toolkit. Okay, the toolkit gives you a 50% chance to disarm a searched for or found unsprung trap. And then you just refer, it's 250 gold pieces. So that's the that's the tool that you need to make this happen. And if you don't have it, then you need to be a dwarf. Apparently dwarves are really good at doing this sort of thing. So for heroes that accept the dwarf, so any other hero such as the wizard, the elf, or the barbarian as a hero, before you move, you must announce that you are moving onto the trap square to attempt to disarm and remove the trap. So if it's there... You need to say that first. You roll your dice to do your movement. I've got three and four, so I've got enough space to do that. And I move, and I'm on there. So if I don't disarm it, it's probably going to activate, and I'm going to get hurt. Uh, you must move onto the trap square and roll one combat dice. That's what you get to try to determine whether you are successful or not. If you roll a skull... You have sprung the trap and you suffer body damage. And I've just explained how each of the different traps kind of work. If you roll either a, a black or a white shield, so a skull means you lose, um, you, you you activate the um, the trap, okay, and then you look at it. So for your falling trap, you're going to wind up with three the, three of these holding hol, hol, um, horrible things. For a pit trap, you take one automatic body point of damage, and for the spear trap, you roll one of the uh, the white dice instead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you roll either one of the, the black or white shields, so that's the black shield for the monster shield, that's the white shield for the hero, okay? This is when you disarm it. A disarm trap is considered gone and is not put onto the game board. So in other words, instead of putting down a falling trap marker or a pit trap marker, anything like that, okay, you wouldn't put it on there. Um, it doesn't it doesn't go down because it no longer exists. It has been removed from play. Uh, uh, now, if you're dealing with a dwarf, so if we swap out the the elf in this place and we go with the dwarf again, if you're going to do this, you need to roll your dice, declare that you are going to move onto the trap to disarm it. Okay, whatever it might be, I've got eight. So I can move there easily. There's the space I've indicated where the trap is. And it works kind of similar. Okay, As a dwarf, you never need a toolkit to disarm a trap. So you don't need to worry about the toolkit if you are a dwarf. Okay, uh, Your odds of success are um, great due to your initial, uh, sorry, your innate skill. Uh, to disarm a trap, you must do the following. Before you move, you must announce, as I said before, that you're moving onto the pit, um, pit trap, or onto the trap square to attempt to disarm it and, and remove the trap. You roll a combat dice, uh, one combat dice, and if you roll a black shield, so this is the black shield here, okay, you have sprung the trap and you suffer the effects of the trap. So whatever body damage you take from that for a pit, like I said, it's one hit point. Three um, a combat dice with skulls being the um, damaging thing for your falling trap. And of course, um, your spear trap is one combat dice. Okay. Uh, if you roll anything except the black shield, the trap is disarmed. So you've got a one in six chance that you'll spring the trap. All the others are going to be successes. So this is the only thing that will spring the trap for the dwarf. So it means that if you have the dwarf player in your game... Even if somebody else has a toolkit, it's better to get the dwarf to actually disarm a trap. 
and sometimes it's better not to disarm the trap because there is a risk of losing or springing the trap in the first place. If you know where they are and you can remember where they are, sometimes unless it blocks your way, it's better just to ignore them and move on. Okay. A disabled pit trap is considered to be um, a regular game board piece. So um, I guess the best way to explain that is if you are, if you find a pit trap, you move onto the space, you disarm it. So in other words, the floor will not give way. You've locked it in place. So the floor is now solid. You don't have to worry about falling down. Okay, that's really what they're trying to do there. So those are um, searching for traps. Uh, what do we got here? Fred, will you do a f future video focusing on the expansion packs, please? They are so cool. Well, the problem is, Mike, I don't have the expansion packs. Um, what I will do, Mike, is I probably will look at alternative house rules for HeroQuest. Uh, I'm probably going to focus a lot more on spell casting. You notice I haven't I haven't pulled out the spell casting card, so I haven't talked about spell casting today at all. Like I haven't done anything with that. And the reason being is I'm going to give it its own sort of session to deal with that. Um, I'm just trying to do the, the, the general basics today, Mike. Uh, what do you got here, Michael? Yeah, you can see how this can take a lot of time. So once you get once you get familiar with the process, it happens a lot faster. This is taking a lot of time because I'm in a live stream trying to explain it to people. Do you know what I mean? And then not only am I explaining it, if all I did was talk and show you some still shots and it was pre-recorded, it'd be faster. But it's going to be a lot, lot slower um, doing it this way because I'm explaining and demonstrating, demonstrating as I go. And if anybody gets stuck and they're not too sure, then I'll. That's why I keep going back and checking the uh, the chat. Yep. So there's a couple of other things that you can also do as actions. Um, but I, what I want to do is I, I kind of want to sort of demonstrate what happens if you're fighting a monster, and um, and sort of what that would look like. So I'm just going to grab a monster and place it on the board. Uh, let's see if I let's grab them. Yeah, let's grab one of those those things there. We'll grab. It's a skeleton warrior. It's a skeleton warrior there too, I think. There's a bunch of them. There we go. So imagine we're in the room with for whatever reason, and who knows what's happened. Maybe somebody. What can happen occasionally is if somebody searches for treasure, they might wind up with a wandering monster. And the wandering monster might be, uh, you know, uh, a body of a, or skull or a skeleton that's lying on the ground that just some sort of res resurrects itself. You can't really deal with those until they activate it, until you do the searching for treasure. But um, if you wind up with a wandering monster, and that might be one of them, <laughs> potentially, and it's the uh, Zargon's turn, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a oh, this is a zombie, actually. So a zombie has a speed which is set. It's not, you don't roll dice for Zargon. All of the monsters have their own set distance that they move, and you just move those squares, which is probably more efficient, honestly. Okay. So five squares is my limit. That's all I can move. I can only move vertically and horizontally just like the player characters. I get two attack dice for uh, my my zombie. And my defense dice is three, which means it's very good at defending. Okay. So I'm going to just duplicate like what a little battle might look like. Zargon's turn comes up for whatever reason. And uh, we, we're going to engage in a battle. You will often find the players always wind up turn, having their turn before Zargon. But let's just say that Zargon actually gets there and gets a turn. Um, you make your attack. You move. You can move part of the five or all of it. You don't have to use all the movement, but you can't split it. It's top of the hour. I'm going to demonstrate this, and then I'm going to go um, and take a break. So for every skull you get, okay, is a wound potentially on our, our elf character. Yep, that doesn't count. You have to get skulls. Just like the player characters, you have to get skulls. If you don't get skulls, sorry, didn't work, okay? 
but then the players still get to defend. If you get a hit, and I've got one hit on them, that means that the elf gets to defend. The, the, the elf defends with two combat dice, because that's what it says here for two defense dice is two. So roll those. And there's one shield and one skull. The skull means nothing for defending, but the shield is important. So one, one body point, minus one for the shield, zero. So there's no damage done to the, um, the elf in this situation. Does that make sense? Now if it rolls round and uh, for whatever reason it's now the elf's turn and the elf is attacking, just like before, you roll two dice to attack your zombie. I've got one skull. Forget about the shield. The skull is the important thing. So there's one skull and your zombie, because they are zombies, they get three dice to defend. So as long as the zombie gets one monster shield, it can stop that blow. And it did. So two skulls doesn't mean anything, but the monster shield will block it. If I get a hero shield, it would mean nothing for a zombie. There's only a one-sixth chance. It's a lot less chance um, for a monster to actually be successful. Okay? So no damage um, done to the zombie. And that's kind of how turns work in terms of battles. Um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll come back. And we'll cover a little bit more and answer a few more questions. I'm going to apologize now. It's been a long time. So trying to remember everything. And I, I honestly, you know how this works, people. When I do demonstrations live, it, it, sometimes it's not as clean and quick as I, I would like. Hello, Overboard. How are you? Overboard is a patron and a moderator. He also has a YouTube channel. Hi, Joe. Uh, deals with uh, miniatures and dice and reviews. Just came home and my um, HeroQuest Mage of the Mirror Elf Pack was just uh, delivered. And Fred is doing a HeroQuest stream. Yes. Um, so for those of you who really wanted to engage and play HeroQuest or build your own HeroQuest game and cobble it together or you were going to go and get the Hasbro board game or you were to go buy the original Milton Bradley game um, if you can find it um, I really wanted to do this because I feel like this is for those of you who are parents whether you're a dad or a mum I feel like this is this is the game that will get your kids involved because it's very tactile you can see lots of things um, it's very three-dimensional um, it's got all the elements that most most uh, kids will, will kind of uh, enjoy. How much, how much will it last over time is another story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Avalon Hill is now owned by Hasbro. Um, we'll have to check out these, um, this thing out. They do seem fun though. Um, have a great night. See you later, Michael. You've probably already gone. Um, Zargon actually gets a turn. Yep. Yeah, and so, so Fred makes a good point. You'll find quite often that Zargon would never get a turn before the players have decimated everything on the table. Um, this is another thing I want to talk about when we start talking about complex combat mechanics and the things that you can do to sort of change things up. The Z, um, the Z key sticks. Uh, so before I take my break, this came in the mail. Another package. I've been getting a lot of packages recently. So uh, this package here, yeah, it's good. you can probably see my address on it. It, it. it doesn't matter. Okay, just don't send anthrax to me. Um, <laughs> you can always get my address anyway because you just got to email me and say, "Huh, I'm sending you a package, Fred. What's your email? Um, your uh, your your physical address, and I'll just give it to you." So it's not it's not it's not, it's not like I could avoid something like that anyway. <laughs> Uh, oh dear. So it's from the book depository. I think I know what it is, but I'm not entirely sure. So uh, I thought what would be good is uh, while I'm away, I'm going to finish this poll here. I'm going to start a new poll and see if you want me to open the package. Should I? It could be. It could be Pathfinder 2E. You never know. Um, it could be the core book. So have you ever played HeroQuest board game? So 52% said yes, no, 45%. Not sure, 3%. Okay, we're going to end that poll. 
So I'm going to put a new poll in, and then I'm going to go and take my break and come back. Um, we haven't actually finished with the rules for Hero Quest because I'm, I'm going to go over them quite a bit. Uh, so here we go. So um, do I open? Do I open the book? D deposit. Oh, depository package. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a yes. Oh, come on, that's a no. Uh, that's a undecided. Undecided. I don't know if. We, do we need to have all of these? Just watching. Oh no, let's not go dash. Don't care. <laughs> don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Let's put that poll up now. Do I open the book depository package? So that gives you five, less than five minutes to respond. You always want to see the packages. Of course you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll be quick about it too. So we will get back to the hero quest stuff. Anyway, let me go take a quick break and I'll be back. All right, here I come. Oh, here we are, back in the seat. Let's have a look what people have to say. I'm assuming we're opening the package, but uh, I will still check. Yes, 100%. Okay, all right, so I open the package. Um, what's the best way to do this without interfering with what I've got set up here in the first place? Can I do this like that? Uh, yeah, we'll do it like that. I'm going to have to lift it up. Uh, 
Okay. Well, this is interesting. What do we got here? I think this is a monster book. It is. Tome of Beast 3. Is this a Tome of Beast 3? Holy Toledo, this is so thin. Let me let me just shift the shift the camera over so you can see. I can't believe this is Cobalt Press. Um Yeah, this is this is uh this is a bit of shock. I've never seen one this 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 is Cobalt Press's Tome of Beast 3. I ordered this because I understand this will be the last monster book they put out for 5e. And I like monster books. And uh, I like monsters. And I'm going to be honest. I probably bought it more for the artwork and the monster lore than I did for the stat block. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yes. That there is the book. But this is really thin. When I, I think this is about half the th thickness of the other ones I've got. I'm pretty sure it is. Look how thin this is. It's a monster book. I mean, it's 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 a lot thicker than um, uh, Wizards of the Coast monster manuals and so forth, but it's it's so thin. Are they getting cheap? Are they getting cheap about things? Oh, it's got a gloss finish. Oh, okay, now I understand. Oh, they've, the artwork has got a, ooh, okay. There's a lot more, okay, this is interesting. So they have upped the quality of the book, made the book smaller. I wonder how many monsters are actually in this thing. It's still got 422 pages. I don't know if that's all monsters, but uh, 400 and something pages worth of monsters. 412? Does that count the count the contents page as well? Probably not, right? Huge contents page. Okay, so maybe maybe it's about just just over 400 pages. A flock of over 400 ferocious monsters for fifth edition. I'm really curious as to what's going on here. Um, this is a uh, this is a bit of a surprise. So, to give you a story of the ridiculous nature of uh, New Zealand, it is so thin. Um, New Zealand Post. I gave them I gave the book depository my correct address, and New Zealand Post could not figure out how to deliver this to me. Failed to deliver. So then, book depository contacts me. I think I've told the story by email and says. Um, the post service did not deliver it to you. We want to try to send it back to you again. Because, I, I mean, I've paid, I've already paid the hundred and so dollars for the thing. It was quite expensive. And uh, and so we need, a, an, uh, we need to make confirm your address is right. So I sent them my address again. And this time it made it. And uh, surprisingly, we've got somebody tearing up the driveway right now. And the workman brought the, uh, the package down to me, which is nice. I appreciate that. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have seen it today. <laughs> um, yeah, of course I'm going to do a review on it. You know I'm going to do a review on it. I'm probably going to save the monster books for my holidays to go through because I'm sitting under a tree uh, at the beach, even if it's a bit on the cold side in New Zealand, is going to be a lot more fun for me, um, I would imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, let's uh, let's head on back to where we were, where we were, where we were. Oh my gosh! Getting to the end of the week and I'm getting tired. I've got a month before it's holiday time. I'm I'm really hanging out for it. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> anyway, we've dealt with a variety of different things here. Um, I think maybe it's a good it's a good point now if I start covering some of the other bits and pieces that you need to know. And I was thinking maybe it would be nice. Oh, so some good news. The download for the adventure book 
oh, this is I didn't I didn't check this bit, but it's it's there. Um, you know how I said you can download the rule book, like the rule system for free as a PDF on Hasbro. Well, you can download the quest book as well. So all the qu pre-made quests that are in here, it's downloadable as well. It's part of the same PDF. I was wondering why it was so long. 32 pages seemed a bit weird. Now I understand because it's the quest book as well. So uh, so you can see how small the the actual rules themselves are. They only go up to page, what is it? 12. There are 12 pages of rules for this game. And that's it. Nothing more. There's spell casting to be covered. Um, I guess I should also, we need to cover to, um, uh, treasure, don't we? Because we haven't covered treasure. I've done traps. Um, I've done combat. We haven't done casting spells. I haven't really covered wandering monsters that much. Searching for treasure is probably one of the things we need to cover. Let's do that. How's that sound? Let's, let's, let's cover that one. <laughs> so, again, we get rid of this. Don't need that one. Somebody decides they want to search for treasure. So, again, you roll your dice. Get rid of these here. Get them out of the way. You roll your dice. You decide whether you're going to move first or you're going to um, search. If you are in the room, you don't need to move at all because then you, you want to be able to use that movement to get to the treasure, right? So, um, so you declare that you are searching for treasure. You can only find treasure in rooms, not in corridors, by the way. So anything like, like a corridor around here, you don't find treasure. It's only in rooms. Uh, a room may be searched for by all four heroes. You don't have to just have uh, one individual. Um, and, and sometimes there's a reason to do that. Sometimes there isn't. But, I mean, essentially anybody can do it. Okay, it's not restricted. Um, you may do so on your own turn. So it needs to, it's still dependent on it. You're waiting for somebody to have a turn. So whichever one it's going to be. Uh, some tra um, treasure is protected by traps. And this is the, the furniture trap, um, treasure chest trap thing that I was discussing before. They're probably the worst ones, as far as I'm concerned. Just because they, they don't follow the same format as everything else. So how does a hero search for treasure? As a hero, you can search a room for treasure only if the room is uninhabited. So one of the things that they have stipulated is you, you, you can't have monsters in a room. That's the first priority is fighting monsters or dealing with monsters first. So you can't search for treasure if there are monsters. So as a hero, you first verbally declare that uh, searching for treasure and um, searching a treasure means you are looking around the entire room. You're opening things up. You're searching for interesting um, objects or gold coins, regardless of what square you're in. Okay, You don't actually have to move the miniature around, as I said. If no special furniture is uh, called out in the quest book, you must draw a random card. So, searching for treasure doesn't mean you necessarily get treasure. You might get something else. And... Uh, drawing for treasure is done from this one here. You can pick up specific um, treasure items or bits of equipment that you can buy, but this is the treasure deck, okay? And you're going to be doing this quite a lot because this is this is the process. This game is built around um, explore, find find stuff, find monsters, kill monsters, and loot the room. That's essentially its predominant sort of focus, okay? Um, you get a different different things from the drawing the card. You can get things such as um, a magical potion, um, gold coins, um, other types of um, various things, um, like it might be an item. Um, these are the valuable things that you're after. Uh, if it's gold, you can spend that between your quests. So you can't spend it during a quest, but you can spend it later on. And that's where you'll be using these cards here, because these things you can go and buy. These are the equipment cards. You get helmets, staves, um, short sword, um, shield, potion of speed. 
The most common thing people want to buy is a potion of healing if they can. And if I can find it, let me find it. Uh, yes, the broadsword is here. I know a lot of people go on about the broadsword. Battle axe, toolkit, where is it? Is it a potion that you can buy? Or is it just the potion of speed? Oh, it's changed a bit. Um, holy water. Okay. All right, well, maybe not. Okay, all right. Maybe I've mis mis um, misread that. So the equipment pack is that one there. So almost half of the treasure cards contain a wandering monster or a hazard. So hazards usually mean traps, okay? These tra types of treasure cards are returned to the deck and may be drawn again in the next um, treasure search. So you draw from the top and you, you shuffle the deck. And you always shuffle before a hero draws from the deck. Um, but as you're playing the game and more of the treasure is removed from the deck, you're going to wind up getting more monsters. So how does Zargon react to heroes searching for treasure? So as Zargon, this is the person who's running all the monsters, um, if there's special treasure descri described in the, in, the, in the quest notes, then you describe it then and there. Okay? Um, you read out the, the, the treasure section that describes what it is. Um, usually special treasure will consist of now where is it can i find it no 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 oh here we go there we are you have a bunch of artifacts the special treasure items are these ones now you'll notice there's no gold value you can't buy these things you have to find them okay there are rings blades talismans wand of uh, magic uh, the wizard uh, cloak, wizard staff, there's armor, rod of telekinesis, fortune of blade, orc spain, all that sort of stuff. All sorts of, and a lot of these um, artifacts are pretty cool. I, I, I would say I, there's been a definite improvement on the artifacts section. Okay. So you're probably, if you've got special treasure, it'll be one of those artifacts. And usually they are quest items. If there's no special treasure in the uh, room that's been searched, then you, the searching hero draws a treasure card as described. However, if the hero draws a wandering monster or has a card, do the following. So if we turn over one card, let's have a look at what we get. We get a wandering monster. So for a wandering monster, these monsters pop out of holes and hidden places. So it might be somewhere in a part of a wall. They might have been hiding behind, underneath the table. Uh, might have been hiding behind, say, a um, uh, in the fireplace or up the fireplace. Might have been hiding under a flagstone in a hidden compartment. Um, yeah, all that sort of thing. So it, it's it's sort of it's a little bit gamey, for sure. I understand. Okay. Now, usually the wandering monsters for an adventure are listed in the quest notes. Okay, that's usually the process. So, as Zargon, you must place the monster next to the treasure, treasure seeker and immediately um, roll attack dice. So, whatever the monster might be, let's say it is a skeleton. And the searching uh, individual was, say, the, uh, the dwarf. You would place them... Uh, so that they are adjacent. Never in the diagonal position. It's either uh, horizontally or vertically. So you place them wherever they would um, pop up. And that's that's where they go. And they will they will act out of turn. So they will attack straight away. So you find the monster that's appropriate for that. So the skeleton. Where is it? Here it is. It's attack dice is two. So you grab two dice for your attacking. And you attack your dwarf. Any kind of skull is an attack. Any shields mean nothing. Okay. So you get one skull. That means the dwarf can still defend. They get two defense dice. So this is the attack. Two defense dice. Okay. I've got one skull. That means nothing. But I get one shield. So I can stop that attack and there's no damage done. Okay. That's done straight away. Wandering monsters are where um, the game masters, or what should I say, Zargon, will actually get to use their monsters. Usually, if you find monsters in a room or a corridor, uh, the players will usually decimate them pretty quickly before Zargon even gets to have a turn. 
Um, you can also refer to the monster chart on the Game Master screen for the correct numbers if you don't um, have the cards in front of you, okay? Or you can't find them. There's a reason why that, uh, that Dungeon Master screen exists. Um, so on this round, you can only attack the Treasure Seeker. You can't attack anybody else. So even if there was another character close by and you placed it beside the person who act, um, did the searching and found the wandering monster, you don't get to attack the barbarian, you only attack the dwarf, whoever's doing the searching, okay? Um, after the attack, the wandering monster remains on the game board and can be moved like other monsters, okay? Uh, but you, as far as I remember, wandering monsters don't usually move. They're simply placed, and then they attack, and then you have to wait until Zargon's turn comes around. If the surrounding squares are occupied um, and it, it is not possible to actually place the monster next to the, the searcher, put the monster in the room as close to the searcher as possible. And then on your next turn, the monster might, can, may, it can move and attack like any other monster. So, for example, if you have a barbarian here and the wizard is here and the dwarf goes searching for treasure finds a wandering monster and you can't place them in the appropriate place then you would simply place them here they don't get to attack the, um, the wizard and they don't get to attack the barbarian because you can't attack diagonally but that's the way they they are placed they don't get to attack they get to take their turn when zargon's official turn comes around so how can heroes respond to the monsters well i've just gone through the same process i went through before and the house is shaking Oh my gosh, what are they doing up there? Okay. <laughs> the whole place is just going completely bananas. Let me go to chat because... Um, oh, sorry people, I didn't transition over. So I've been demonstrating this whole thing. And, oh man, I knew that I'd make this mistake at some point. 12 pages of rule. Search tre um, um, foot treasure. It's a trap here. Have monster. Uh, yes, but searching for traps is a health hazard. Wandering monsters all the time. Hands of gold are always cold. <laughs> Don't see the cards. Sorry, Spirit Wolf and everybody else. I apologize. I, I I would, I suppose I should, can I do it really quickly? Can I do it really quickly? I, I had forgotten that I transitioned, I hadn't transitioned over so you could see the screen. So, yes, wandering monster. You draw the card. <laughs> uh, there. So you're doing a search. Let's do this very quickly. Okay, find the wandering monster, because you draw a card, you place them straight next to whoever did the searching, and can't be diagonal because they can't make an attack, you make your attack straight away, okay, skeleton gets two dice, you roll those, yep, and then you defend with your hero, your hero gets two dice, you defend with those, done, okay, skulls as a wound, shield stop it, and for a hero, the shield is that shield, that's the monster shield, doesn't count. Um, and yeah, if if you can't actually do it straight away, because all I do to get to the attack because there's heroes in the way, then the closest place would be here. If you can't put it there because there's, all the heroes are clustered, then you put it, it over here. You still can't make an attack until Zargon's official turn. So that's what I was demonstrating before. I'm oh, really sorry, people. Um, I have to be careful not to keep jumping back and forth. Sorry about that, Fred. Hopefully that was... That was not nearly as well as I just described and demonstrated it a second ago. I've got to be, I've got to be careful. No more jumping back to my face. I think that would be the, that's the, that's the problem. If I jump back to my face, you can't see what's going on. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, now, were there any other questions? Um, I don't want to go over magic today, just because magic is there's so many different magic card spells. And there's, a, um, there's, there's stuff for Zargon and there's stuff for the players and there's a lot going on. Um, what I suppose I can do is I can talk about dead characters, like when a character dies. Because there is a section on um, dead characters, should it happen. And it's possible, you might have somebody who dies. Uh, so for example, if I'm doing this, let's just put them back here. Say a character winds up out of, out of commission. Um, we used to just turn the character and lay them down so we knew where their treasure was. So, dead heroes. So, a, a hero, uh, when you die, it's because you have reached zero hit points. And uh, if you have a healing spell, uh, you can use that 
or a healing potion to save yourself. So if you have access to a spell, it's sort of like an automatic response. Anything that allows you to heal yourself um, would allow you to, uh, to, to avoid this. So uh, water healing, the spell water healing would be one. If you've got a, a potion of um, healing, which I am kind of surprised I can't find it. Here we go. So the, the Elixir of Life is uh, one that would save your life. You could use that one. And uh, where is the other one? Is they Have they got rid of the Potion of Healing? Maybe they have. I haven't seen it, which is weird. Maybe it's in the treasure pack. That'll be what it is. It'll be in the treasure pack here somewhere. Gold, 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 gold. Hazards, 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 hazards. Brew, yeah. Hero no, that's Heroic Brew. No, where's the Potion of Healing? Potion of Defense. Here we go. That's a potion of healing. So you could use that to save yourself. So a spell or a potion, you can drink it automatically to save yourself if you wind up hitting zero hit points. So if you have them, the best thing you can do is um, save them for when you go down. Because you do go down quite a lot in this game. So what happens to a hero who is dead, okay, or dies? You're out of the game for the rest of the quest, so you don't get to play anymore. This is one of the aspects of Hero Quest that is a pain in the butt. I, I'm going to say it now, because suddenly you could be sitting there, or just I mean, now it's just go wander off and do something else. You may, however, rename your hero and play them uh, as a new character in the next quest. So essentially, what you're doing is you're just making a new character up with a new name. Okay, your armor, weapons, and treasure that belong to you prior to your death. Uh, can be picked up by any other hero in the room, but it can't be picked up by you who, who died. So it winds up going to whoever decides to uh, to pick up your stuff. So there's a warning there, and that is, if there are no other heroes in the room or corridor uh, when you die, any monster in the room or corridor uh, may claim your possessions. Uh, it may not, however, use them. Uh, they are removed from the game when that happens. So the last thing you want to do is be in a room with monsters and die, and there's no heroes there to pick up your stuff. And if the monsters pick it up, even if you kill the monsters, you can't you can't claim them off the monster. It's like they, they disappeared into the void. Yeah? <clears throat> and then, how can a hero escape death? Um, well... There are a bunch of spells and potions I just described. So that's sort of the, the basic process. I think I think that might be enough. It's it's a it's been an hour and forty minutes almost. I am exhausted and um, I knew that demonstrating and explaining stuff was going to be difficult. Uh, what I need from you people, those of you who are here, I really need you to give me feedback where I balls things up. If I made a mistake. Don't give me a hard time about it. Just, just, just quietly say, you know, just say nicely in the in the comment section um, where I made the mis the error, because I'll get better at doing this. Okay, I will get better at doing it, uh, but I, I will need a bit of help from you because I haven't played the game officially for thirty five, at least thirty five years. It's been a long time, and so what I'm doing is I'm I'm, I'm working from what I remember and what I've been boning up on. There are no monster heroes in Hero Quest, but I believe there are a bunch of different options that you can pick up. These these are just four of the potential characters you can play. You can actually download new car um, hero cards too, by the way. So there are there there's a bunch of other ones. I think there's a, a bard. Um, if I can find the information on them and and find links to them, but yeah, I found a whole bunch of hero cards that have been uh, made. There are not just the Barbarian, the Dwarf, the Elf, and the Wizard. So if you're wanting to play something else outside of those four, I'll I'll grab them and uh, make sure there's a link available for it, okay? Uh, but what I really, like I said, what I really need is I need you to describe when I, if there's something I explained that I didn't do a very good job about so I can adjust it for next time. And um, if there is something in particular I need to uh, lay out better than I did. Like, is, is this the right way to demonstrate it? I'm not sure. I think it is, but I'm not sure. So if there's something I needed to include in some way that would have assisted, please let me know because I want people to be able to use this. And what I will do in the future is I'll take 
the small bits of rolls that are here and I'll try to turn them into shorts. That's the vertical form short so that people can just refer to them quickly. Um, I'm not going to promise I'm going to do them fast because shorts videos make me no money and YouTube no money and the only person that benefit are people who like to flick through and watch uh, less than 60 seconds of video. And so um, I'll still make them, but yeah, I'm not going to promise the, the time frame for that. In any case, let's go over to here. And yes, I haven't talked about magic, I'm aware. That's quite deliberate on my part. Because I'm going to save that for um, a little bit later. <laughs> we will probably be dealing with magic and fighting uh, next time. Um, I'm not going to go into all the magic spells. I'm probably going to save that for a little bit later on. Yeah. Oh, I'm, ex I'm, I'm so tired now. So I'm going to call it quits and go to work. Uh, last day of work for the week. I'm so pleased. Uh, so what is happening tomorrow? Almost forgot. Tomorrow is a long day for me. Um, I'm very close to finishing the role-playing game rules, the basic stuff. Um... I believe we have damage. Uh, what is what is what does the dungeon master or game master do? What does the how do you play the game in an example? I still got to write that stuff. I think I need to talk a little bit about um, a variant for doing damage and uh, grappling and throwing. So I'm going to try to put that down so that it's it's, it's explained reasonably well. Um, that will probably be a four or five hour stream. I'll start at ten o'clock. I'll take a, a break every hour. Uh, the windows are arriving for the house you're building. Well, that's more important. You're welcome, Brian, by the way. Right, so I missed the live stream. Sorry, I will um, watch the uh, the replay. Yeah, so look, any time you see things are sort of coming adrift, just to, just tell me when when I need to sort of, um, you know, change the way I do it. Uh, we, we kind of broke things up by, by opening a, a package today, so that was a little bit odd, I suppose. Uh... Great watch while I was uh, cutting bricks. You were cutting bricks. Oh my gosh. Okay. Anyway. So yes, building a role playing game tomorrow. Hopefully, I'm hoping the draft is done tomorrow. But to, if it's not, I'm going to do another one the following week, and it should be done then. At least the first draft. And yes, the first draft will go up on Patreon. With no barrier, anybody can download it. Um, make it available to everybody, um, because really. I, <laughs> I'm not Wizards of the Coast. I don't have distribution. I just need to get people's eyes on this thing. In any case, and um, we'll see if we can make it viable in some way. So I want to say a big thank you to my patrons who support me on Patreon. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody who took part in the poll today, watched the live stream, um, took part in the chat, uh, or just watched the live stream and didn't um, comment. That's fine too. I really do appreciate it. If you're watching the re replays, that's great. I do appreciate it. Uh, I'm hoping that this will get better over time. I'm, I've allocated three more weeks for Hero Quest, so we can go through everything, cover every possible thing that you might need to know, and uh, hopefully I'll get better at doing this too. Which because I want to, I want to roll back to Hero Quest in a year's time uh, and have another look at it because uh, I think it's a, I think it's a great game. So, you know the story, wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, the night, or the wee wee early morning, I want you to look after yourself um, and your family and your friends. And if you have neighbours and they're not zombies, be nice to them. Okay? And hey, till next time, keep rolling those twenties. Yes, I will do home brewing. Uh, what time is my next live stream? Tomorrow, uh, it is, sorry. Um, oh, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Uh, Brian, it's 10 a.m. New Zealand time, which I think means it's... Jeez, oh, this, is, this is where I get stuck. 10 a.m. Uh, so now... 
10, that's three hours off from what it was before. So I think that's 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time in Los Angeles. And if you are in Mountain Daylight Time, it is 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, and uh, is it, uh, yeah, is it, that's right. That's right, that's right. And then Central Daylight Time, because you're in Daylight Time, aren't you? It would be, tomorrow is going to be um, Central, it'll be 4 p.m. So very early, and it's going for five, four or five hours, so you, you're going to catch me at some point. And then um, Eastern Daylight Time, so that's Los Angeles, Florida, that would be 5 p.m. So I'm starting very early, and we're going from there. So yeah, <laughs> that's the time frame for that one. 